I wanted to talk to Fletcher because of a book he wrote called Wonderworks, The 25 Most Powerful Inventions in the History of Literature, which is this strange and captivating work full of twists and turns and fascinating asides. It's the kind of book that makes you want to talk to the author just to make sure there aren't more bits of wisdom out there to be had. Anyway, I'm on the phone with Angus, struggling to understand what went wrong with The Little Mermaid. And Angus, since he's Angus, says, oh, the thing you have to understand is that there's actually two categories of fairy tales, the original kind and the modern kind. And then Angus starts talking about some of the earliest recorded fairy tales, like the stories collected by the 16th century Italian writer Giovanni Straparola. Straparola published a two-volume set known as The Facetious Knights. Puss in Boots is a Straparola story. So yeah, so there are these two amazing things that we start to see in Straparola's fairy tales, which again are the kind of most ancient ones we have written down. The first is that good luck happens to people who are fools. So a fool might find a lucky fish. And and by a fool, I mean an actual fool. I mean somebody who is so dense in the story that he says terrible, rude things to everybody he meets, is an inept fisher person, has no apparent positive qualities whatsoever, and then ends up a prince. And it can go even further than that. It can happen to people who who are bad. A classic example of this kind of story is an ancient fairy tale about a girl named Adamantina. Adamantina's family is starving, and she's sent by her older sister to buy food at the market. Adamantina goes to the market with the family's last money, and does she buy food? No, she makes a whimsical purchase of a doll that she sees because she happens to like this doll. And she takes this doll home with her. And her older sister is so distraught that she has this breakdown is, oh my goodness, this is the end of the family. You have ruined the family. It's all over. And lo lo and behold, the doll turns out to be a magic doll. And it spits forth money. And this is the beginning of a series of just bizarre, improbable happenings that, that, that occur in the story. And Adamantina does not deserve them at all. She's not virtuous. She's not smart. She's not nice. She's not kind. The doll is a lottery ticket. The doll is a lottery ticket. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. Yes. Yeah. Fletcher calls these kinds of stories fairy tale twist stories. If you look at all the stories collected by Straparola, they almost always end with fairy tale twists. For thousands of years, People sat around the fire and listened to storytellers. And what are the narratives that survived the evolution of centuries? Stories in which heroes did not deserve their fate. Audiences wanted to believe that life could suddenly go from bad to good. It's not simply that life could suddenly go from... that there could be a sudden twist. It's that the twist would be unrelated to the disposition and character of the protagonist, that I didn't have to meet a certain qualification to be eligible for this good fortune. It was bestowed on anyone. Yeah. But then in the 17th century, fairy tales took a dramatic turn. The key figure was the French writer Charles Perrault. He read the fairy tales that had been collected by earlier writers and loved them, wanted to share them with the world. But Perrault thought they needed a little tweaking. He said, you know what? These tales are so primitive. They were written before the age of reason. Uh, They were written before the Enlightenment. And reason tells us that all these instances in which good things are coming from bad, they can't happen because life follows this logic that's been created by God. And I want these stories to instill that. So I'm just going to make these changes. I'm going to change it so that good things only happen to good people. And bad things happen to bad people. And so there's no more good happening to bad. There's only good happening to good. Fletcher calls these kinds of fairy tales poetic justice stories. The classic example of this second type of story is Cinderella, an ancient tale which Charles Perrault revised. Later, the Brothers Grimm did their own version of the tale in Germany. Here's how it begins with our introduction to Cinderella. The wife of a rich man fell sick, and when she felt that her end drew nigh, she called her only daughter to her bedside and said, Always be a good girl, and I will look down from heaven and watch over you. Soon afterwards, she shut her eyes and died, and was buried in the garden. And the little girl went every day to her grave and wept, and was always good and kind to honor her mother. Cinderella's father remarries. Cinderella gets an evil stepmother and two evil stepsisters. 
But no matter what they do to her, Cinderella remains pious and good. It happened once that her father was going to the fair and asked his wife's daughters what he should bring to them. Fine clothes, said the first. Pearls and diamonds, said the second. Now, child, said he to his own daughter, what will you have? The first sprig, dear father, that rubs against your hat on your way home, said she. So the father brings the evil stepdaughters all manner of finery, and Cinderella gets, as requested, a twig. He gave it to his daughter. Then she took it and went to her mother's grave and planted it there, and cried so much that it was watered with her tears. And there it grew and became a fine tree. Oh, come on. Cinderella is an angel. And what happens to this angel? You know the story. A magic bird gives her a beautiful dress, and off she goes to the ball. The handsome prince falls in love with this mysterious unknown beauty. She leaves behind her slipper. The prince says, whosoever fits into the slipper will be his queen. Her evil stepsisters try to fit and fail. Cinderella tries it on, and it fits perfectly, and she lives happily ever after. Virtue is rewarded. Meanwhile, what happens to her evil stepsisters? When the wedding with the prince was to be held, the two false sisters came, wanting to gain favor with Cinderella and to share her good fortune. But they get attacked by pigeons that peck out their eyes. And thus, for their wickedness and falsehood, they were punished with blindness all their days. That's poetic justice. Thus, for their wickedness, they were punished. The Cinderella story gets adapted for the screen by Walt Disney in maybe the most famous of all of his animated movies. But it's only the dreams and wishes of the beautiful, angelic Cinderella that come true. With Cinderella, Disney went all in on poetic justice. The famous movie that so many of us saw as children, Cinderella, that rescued the Magic Kingdom from bankruptcy and became the logo of Disney. And ever since then, all of Disney's fairy tales have had that same story model of good coming from good, or virtue rewarded, or poetic justice. It's this inheritance of the Enlightenment. A few years ago, Angus Fletcher was approached to do a project on measuring children's emotional reactions to the stories they heard. We actually have a technology here which can track how interested kids as young as four are mm -hmm. in things. You know, if we have 10 or 12 or 14 kids, enough of a range, we can actually tell you very specifically uh, whether kids like the ending or not and how much they like it. But the overall thing is... Is this eye tracking? Is this eye tracking stuff? What are you, what are you, how are you doing that? It's secret, and I'm not kidding. So Fletcher does his top secret analysis of little kids watching Disney movies. And he thinks he knows what he's going to find. The kids prefer Cinderella. They don't want the moral anarchy of the fairy tale twist. And sure enough, the kids squeal with delight. They love the songs. But then it all falls apart. There's a kind of post-Disney hangover. There's been this whole history of, of condemning Disney fairy tales because they're not realistic or because they advance kind of stereotypes or kind of unrealistic expectations about what princesses should be and so on and so forth. But it turned out it really wasn't any of those things that was going on. It was the narrative structure. The kids liked the characters, the adventure, the humor, the idea that mice and other animals could do all manner of cool things. But they struggled with the idea that good always comes from good and bad from bad. Why? Because your child is perfectly capable of extrapolating what all this means. What your brain processes is, well, bad things are happening to me. Why are bad things happening to me? They're happening to me clearly because I'm bad. And if bad things happen to bad people and I'm bad, then worse things are going to start to happen because there's no way for me to turn this train around. And what we see is that these stories generate what's called catastrophizing. And catastrophizing is when you become convinced that there's no way to break the, the, the cycle of bad feeling. And this is masked in Disney fairy tales because the immediate emotional effect of watching a Disney story is to feel good, is to feel happy because the ending is so sentimental and so positive. But over time, it has this corrosive negative effect. Now, by contrast, 
What happens when a child hears a fairy tale twist story? Those kinds of stories defeat catastrophizing. They short circuit that and they say, no, 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 no. Bad doesn't always come from bad. Good can come from bad. Just relax. Life is not logical. Kids prefer fairy tale twists to poetic justice. They prefer Adam and Tina to Cinderella. Now, why does this matter to our discussion of the Little Mermaid film? Because the Little Mermaid is poetic justice on steroids. Good things happen not just to good people, but to rich and powerful and beautiful people. And bad things happen not just to bad people, but ugly bad people. When Prince Eric wanted to claim his beautiful bride, he got to take the law into his own hands, become a vigilante, kill Ursula in cold blood with no legal consequences whatsoever because he's a handsome prince. No other reason. Handsome, entitled Eric gets away with murder. And Ariel, our beautiful spirited mermaid who wants to marry a prince, she gets to marry a prince. Without really having to lift a finger, by the way. In the end, Daddy does everything. Daddy gets out his golden trident and turns Ariel into a female human in a sparkly dress. This is unearned poetic justice. It's 1% poetic justice. I'm still waiting for the Disney sequel where Ariel gets into Stanford as a legacy admission after her dad endows the King Triton Institute of Aquatic Governance. One of the things I realized in talking to Angus Fletcher was how difficult it was to make the transition from poetic justice thinking back to fairy tale twist thinking. It doesn't feel right. Bad must be met with bad so that good can be met with good. It feels awfully rote. When you watch the movie, you just feel from the beginning like you know it's going to happen. So Ursula has great power under the sea and decides at the end of the movie that what she wants to do is to disguise herself as Ariel and or as a, as a beautiful princess and marry Eric, right? The prince. But what if Eric is revealed to be actually kind of dull and nasty? And so Ariel realizes, oh, let her... Let her marry him. You know, if that's what you want. <laughs> it turns out the guy's a bit of a jerk. I wanted to give Angus my ideas for fixing The Little Mermaid, but I was struggling. Or what if the idea of outside of the water, she loses her power? So she becomes Eric's bride, but she is now just a normal person who's stripped of all of the... Because she's chosen the terrestrial world over the underwater world. She's now just an ordinary, hapless citizen. Now, I suppose what we're doing there is we are, we're giving a bad ending to a bad person, but at least it's, it's, a, it's a more interesting bad ending, I suppose. Yes, it's more creative. I hear a distinct lack of enthusiasm in Angus's voice. I don't know if there's any way not to, we do have to kind of put Ursula in her place. No, you do not. I still couldn't get it out of my head that bad had to come from bad. It was as if everything Fletcher had tried to tell me had sailed right over my head. That's how deeply embedded poetic justice is. It's in our bones. I mean, we have this obsession in the modern world that somehow if you do something bad, you have to be punished for it. No, if you do something bad, uh, we just have to make sure you don't do that bad thing again. You know, it, it's rehabilitation. It's medicine. I mean, you know, uh, we, don't, we don't punish diseases. We don't, you know, once we've removed cancer from the body, we don't, we don't then send it to jail and punish it. You know, it's just like we... So you think we should be able to... We should fix Ursula? Well, I think we should just stop her from doing whatever she's doing. We should have a conversation with her about maybe why this isn't helpful. Fletcher's point was that making Ursula bad and then punishing her for her badness is what you do if you don't care about the story you're telling. You don't think about the audience, the little girl, who's trying to understand the way life really works. No, you've turned into Aesop, who says there's a boring ant out there and a grasshopper who wants to make music, and I'm sorry, but that means the grasshopper has to starve to death. If he were alive today, Aesop would have a bungalow on the Disney lot. He'd be their rewrite man. 
It's not just that I think that Disney has um, sent a lot of fairy tales in the world which have overall made us less happy. Um, I think it's also that they are a force against innovation and change and growth in storytelling as a whole. And they are destroying our capacity as a people to think of new directions and new paths and new plots. I mean, my kids love Disney Plus. I'm not going to pretend <laughs> like I've somehow managed to keep it out of my own house. But, you know, I mean, I, I really think that we have reached a point in our society where we're repeating the error of the Enlightenment and we're allowing this one institution that thinks it knows the right way to do things to crush out mm -hmm. the basis of our nature, which is creativity, change, spontaneity, um, and like you said, possibility. So I went back and watched The Little Mermaid again, only this time with Angus Fletcher's words ringing in my ears. And I began to realize, I think we can rescue this movie.